Beloved by God Church, let us stand up and serve the Lord. Let us confirm the confession of the faith of our heart, the promise that belongs to the door of our hope. May the resurrection of Christ reign within our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for the great privilege of being in this place that your hand has appointed for the worshiping of your holy name. Now allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights that are not reachable for us and destroy all burden and sin that binds us. May in this service as previously all the works of devil be cursed, illnesses, poverty, untimely death, demonic possession, all matter of fear, depression, destruction, ignorance, and error, all of this may it depart from the tents of your holy people. Now stand, O Lord, upon the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might, and may your saints be clothed into your salvation and rejoice before your face. Give us more of your spirit, saturate us with your Holy Spirit, allow us to find your great face. We thank you that the service is presented by Apostle Arkady into your godly hands, and we pray continue to lead it with a mighty and powerful arm, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. The Book of Apostle Paul, Hebrews 11.5 by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God the theme of the sermon to please God studying this unique in its significance place of scripture we've noted Apostle Arkady writes that Enoch who is mentioned in this verse although he belongs to the exemplary pleiad of heroes of faith, in this particular verse, Enoch stands uniquely apart from the rest of the other heroes of faith, because unlike Enoch, here is what the scriptures say about the rest of the heroes of faith. These all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And about Enoch, it is written that Enoch was taken, that he did not see death. But the rest had died in faith, not having received the promise, but saw it from afar off. But Enoch did receive it. Therefore, within the meaning that is contained in this verse, we see presented a revelation of a unique in its nature promise, called to destroy within the mind of a Christian person the false strongholds of salvation, which within the span of 2,000 years, due to the ignorance of carnal leaders, have perverted the truth about the kingdom of heaven, turning it from news of salvation into a deadly deception. Here is what this verse does. So that where the stronghold of death is today, you may erect the stronghold of life. You need to first, as Brother Kadi writes, you need to destroy in the mind of a Christian person the false strongholds of salvation. And these strong, false strongholds of salvation were implemented by carnal leaders. And why were they implemented into our mind? So that the good news of the gospel would become a deadly deception and would become for us death. And in the sermon, Apostle Arkady offers ten particular false strongholds of salvation. And we will see that all of these ten strongholds, Apostle Arkady writes, there are many more of them, and every time we see them, these strongholds of salvation, he will sh he, he shows them to us in many different angles. And he will give us these ten that are already implemented, established in the church, and many of them we ourselves have accepted and even some may still be convinced of and let's now examine ourselves what are these false strongholds <clears throat> first false strongholds of salvation built or established within the mind of carnal men 
is a false assurance or confidence of your salvation, which is received into the heart in the seed of the word of truth in the format of a guarantee, but is received as a personal possession, the first false stronghold when the Lord gives you salvation as a guarantee, as a seed, but a person receives it thinking that it is all he needs and he is saved. The Lord only gave him a seed, but he's not sowing that seed and thinks that is all there is to that. The acceptance of such false strongholds of salvation is pretty much founded upon the perverted meanings of specific places of Scripture who in the physical barbarically tear out these places from the general context of the Spirit and letter, uh, letter of the Scriptures. Due to this, millions of Christians who receive their salvation in the format of the given-to-them guarantee as their possession when going to that side of the river from the temporary realm to the eternal realm in hopeful anticipation of heavenly paradise ended up in hell with the devil and his angels and with others like them. Because due to their carnal state, which lacks the Spirit of Christ, they considered the true words of the apostles and prophets, whom God had placed over them as foolishness, and had not allowed the truth of the preached to them word to destroy in their mind the false strongholds of salvation, which resist knowing God, as it is written, but, but the carnal man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Therefore, a person who received salvation in the seed, in the format of a guarantee, but has not grown the seed of, of justification into the fruit of righteousness, will never be able to walk before God, and consequently will never be able to please God, due to which will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him and with the devil and his angels. And so, looking at this final phrase, it's a terrifying phrase. And so this is a curse that will be the fate of many people who did not abandon this false stronghold of salvation, thinking that the seed he received is all he needed to be saved. And so we, for ourselves, can note that the Lord gives us salvation as a guarantee in the format of a seed so we can produce fruits of righteousness. Second, false strongholds of salvation consist in many saints being caught in a snare or in a trap of the evil one due to the inability to forgive one another before the setting of the sun, due to which their personal sins will not be forgiven by God, however much they may confess them. How unfortunate. I confess my sins and the Lord does not forgive them. I confess before the messenger of God all my sins, and the Lord does not forgive any of my sins. Matthew six fourteen fifteen. 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. <laughs> A person not capable of forgiving his neighbor <clears throat> is not able to walk before God and consequently will not be able to please God due to which will be required to share the lake of fire with those like them and with the devil and his angels. This phrase I like, hell will be overfilled with people with a bitter or offended heart whose offense did not allow God to forgive their personal sins because they were not able to forgive and they needed to forgive. And you cannot allow these this offense to continue to uh, be present in your heart after the setting of the sun. And many people die in their sleep. And the, the sleep a person uh, is in is often death, and that's how they uh, pass over to the other side. And so people die, or people are sleeping and have offense in their heart. Uh, they die and then go where they did not expect. 
Third, false strongholds of salvation consist in the fact that many who are born from the seed of the word of truth perceive the false strongholds of salvation established in their body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, when in actuality, in the, be- in the better circumstance, this is a Jewish synagogue, and in the worse circumstance, this is a synagogue of Satan. As it is written, Matthew seven eighteen nineteen, 19, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so by their fruits you will know them. And so a person who has not built his body into the temple of the Holy Spirit is not able to walk before God and consequently is not able to please God, due to which he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him and with the devil and his angels. The key word you need to build your body into the temple of the Holy Spirit. Where is the the false stronghold that a person, as soon as he is born again, he is convinced that he is already the temple of the Holy Spirit. The apostle says, wait, you need to build yourself into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, so that you can bring spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. A person needs to do this, create this in himself, to bring spiritual sacrifice or to pray before God, you need to be a priest. And to be a priest, a person needs to serve in the temple. And if my body's not a temple, and as our Apostle Arcadia shows, and so my body, it's good if uh, my body is a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, but sometimes this is a synagogue of Satan. What is a synagogue? A synagogue is when we studied about Jairus, This is a person that reads the New Testament and Old Testament, but interprets everything with his own mind. This is a synagogue. The question is, what is the difference between a Jewish synagogue and the synagogue of Satan? A Jewish synagogue, when he's confronted with the truth, as Jairus, it falls at the feet of Jesus, embraces him, and receives him. The synagogue of Satan will never uh, allow anyone to renew its mind. A synagogue of of Satan is ready, is not to receive any leader, but the Jewish synagogue is ready to have its heart committed and its mind renewed. A synagogue of Satan will claim they have their own mind and their own understanding. A Jewish synagogue, there will be an element of humility where a person stands before the anointed of God when Jesus, in the form of the person whom God has sent, is in your presence. And so when Jairus, as the Jewish synagogue, when he was interpreting with his own mind, the the mind was not renewed with the spirit of our mind, with the scriptures, what did he do? He fell at the feet of Jesus and received him. And so to become a temple of the Holy Spirit is only possible when a person is a Jewish synagogue, when he acknowledges that, Lord, without you, I will not be able to do anything, and I need to commit my life to the person who will be able to teach me and instruct me. Fourth, false strongholds of salvation consist in the fact that many Christians who are baptized by the Holy Spirit perceive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the leadership of the Holy Spirit and identify the act of baptism of the Holy Spirit as their them being family with God. Romans 8, 13, 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put, the, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And so these are the true strongholds of our salvation, the true strongholds of our salvation. A person who does not possess in himself the ability to be led by the Holy Spirit and a person perceiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the leadership of the Holy Spirit is not able to walk before God and consequently is not able to please God, due to which he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him and with the devil and his angels. And so the leadership of the Holy Spirit is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is not spirituality. 
pastor says that uh, speaking in tongues is not spirituality. It is a, a spiritual expression that helps you become spiritual. But the leadership of the Holy Spirit is when we know the commandments of God and we fulfill the commandments of God and not when we're just ex, uh, expressing something spiritual in the form of tongues. And this in the Protestant churches has become a, this false stronghold has become very strong uh, where they identify their uh, closeness with God, their 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 level of spirituality based on uh, them speaking in tongues. And if someone isn't, then they say they're not a son of God. The stronghold needs to be absolutely uprooted from our mind. Fifth, false strongholds of salvation consist in man thinking that he is worshiping in spirit and in truth when he prays in tongues. At the same time, actual worshiping in spirit and in truth is first when we pray or we bring an offering upon the place where God has put a remembrance for his name, and second when we pray from the position of being members of this place with boldness that corresponds to the truth and that corresponds to the demands of the perfect will of God. Again, what does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? Pastor very interestingly explained, I'm very surprised often when Pastor identifies these things. Pastor shows us from different angles. And so as much as Pastor uh, talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth, he shows it from different angles which means that the pastor sees the scriptures as a precious stone, and a precious stone has many facets, has different angles, and it illuminates, and it's uh, beautiful uh, in every direction that you turn it. And so as soon as you turn it a little bit, and you will already see a a different facet, you will see something uh, new and beautiful. And so he had noted that in spirit and in truth, to worship in spirit and in truth is possible only upon the place where the Lord has put a remembrance for his name that is in the church, in the church with boldness. And so if a person has boldness but is not in a church, then worshiping in spirit and in truth is not possible. It's only possible in or upon that place where there's a remembrance of the Lord's name and when we boldly pray upon this place. 1 John 5, 14, 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. And so we receive what we ask of him because he hears us and he hears us because we ask according to his will. And to ask according to his will, I need to be taught how to ask and what to ask for and in what format we're supposed to ask according to his will. A person not possessing the ability to worship in spirit and in truth and perceiving the speaking of tongues as worship in spirit and in truth is not able to walk with or before God and consequently is not able to please God, due to which they will be required to share the lake of fire with those like them and with the devil and his angels. And so again, the Lord, the pastor, our pastor notes uh, that this person will share the lake of fire with those like them and the devil and his angels because he perceived the speaking of tongues as worshiping in spirit and in truth. Worshiping in spirit and in truth is identified again first, finding a place finding a place where there's a remembrance of his holy name. Because upon this place is where the Lord will speak. He will not speak from any place. And so we found this place where there's a remembrance of his name, and upon this place he teaches us, and upon this place we communicate with him and he responds to us. But of course, first, we need to determine that we found this place. We found this place. If I come to this place where I can hear, uh, the truth. If I come just so I could say something, this is not a place of the remembrance of his name. This is not a, a, a concert hall, although we may have, of course, 
<clears throat> beautiful singing groups of, of song, but the priority, of course, as we know, is to worship him. Sixth, false strongholds of salvation consist in men of carnal ignorance of the truth, convincing other men that God has loved the whole world, when in fact God only loved each one that believes in this world, regardless of tongue, nation, or tribe. John 3.16, for God so loved whoever believes who is in the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him in this world should not perish, but have everlasting life. A person being convinced that God equally loves both the righteous and the wicked and that he gave his son for the one as well as the other cannot walk with God and furthermore cannot please God, due to which he will be required to share the lake of fire with those like him as well as with the devil and his angels. And so all people with a tolerant mentality and the church today, unfortunately, is overfilled. I don't know in other countries, but in America, this tolerant mentality has uh, intercepted the churches. And we see a terrible statistic in that. Seventh, false strongholds of salvation consist in us being convinced that from the time we are born again by hearing the word of truth in the form of the seed of the preached to us word of truth that Christ lives within us from that moment. When actually Christ begins living in us only after we partake in the crucifixion of Christ, submerging into baptism, into the death of the Lord Jesus, and die through the law to the law. Here's the confirmation, Galatians 2, 19, 20. For I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. A person who in the death of the Lord Jesus has not died through the law to the law is not able to be crucified with Christ, and therefore Christ is not able in any way to live in the heart of such a person because our eye is still there, our personal eye. We die so that it is not so it is not I that lives, but now Jesus or Christ that lives within me. And so the death of the Lord Jesus Christ is called, that we are called to partake in it so that Christ can live in us and not us, and we no longer then live but Christ in us. The carnal mind, as we know, uh, will not allow this to happen if we do not, uh, if we do not partake in the crucifixion process and be crucified with him. And so as we know, we have a throne, of course, uh, upon, in our, on, on our tongue as well that we need to bridle and discipline. We therefore conclude that such a person cannot walk with God and furthermore cannot please God, due to which such a person will also be required to share the lake of fire with those like him as well as with the devil and his angels. And so the one that had not allowed Christ to live in him, that Christ live in him, For Christ to live in me, I need to state that, Lord, it is not I who live, but you who live in me. And this is possible when we die through the law to the law. We are born according to grace. And as soon as we receive grace, grace says now that I need to reign. And how? The law. You need to now take it. This is the great tool In the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will then die for your nation, the house of your father, and your own personal desires, corrupt desires, and then grace will be able to reign through righteousness. And as we see, grace, it calls the law to assist, and the law helps grace, as strange as it is, to reign within our life. And as it is when we read about what our oath inheritance is, 
Apostle Arkady had shown that the law of Moses, the law that we die for the law of sin and death, is a part of our imperishable inheritance. And if we don't understand the importance of the law of Moses, we don't understand the importance of the cross, because Christ did not die according to, to grace. What they did on the cross to him was not according to grace. What they did, this was the entire severity of the law. Whatever you can imagine, uh, according to the law, was poured out upon one man, the individual son of God. And so Christ did not die according to grace. And for us to die through the law to the law, the Lord utilizes this very law for this. Eighth, false strongholds of salvation consist in us trusting that being born from God gives us the right to live under grace, when at the same time we receive the right to live under grace only in the moment when grace reigns within our heart. To live under grace is possible when grace reigns within our heart. Due to the grown fruit of righteousness that has grown in the Eden of our heart, in the form of the born by us Methuselah, giving us the right to the power to pay the price for the ability to walk with God and to please God. Romans 5.21 So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so a person in whose heart grace does not reign by the grown by him fruit of righteousness from the seed of justification is not able to walk with God and furthermore is not able to please God. And so for us to be under grace, it's necessary for grace to reign within our heart through righteousness. We receive justification according to grace. Grace gives us justification. And we receive justification from grace, and it's looking at us, and it's and the grace tells it, asks us, "Do you know what to do with this?" Grace needs to reign. Grace gave us justification, and giving us justification, grace wants to reign in us, and we need to. And we need to understand that salvation is given to us in the form of a seed, not as a possession, but as a seed, so that you can grow the seed of justification into the fruits of righteousness, the character of Christ. And when I see the character of Christ in you, the grace then that gave you this justification will reign in your life through righteousness. And this is very important. Ninth, false strongholds of salvation consist in us trusting that being born from hearing the preach to us word of truth that at this moment he has already made us kings and priests to God when actually we only become kings and priests to God when we as living stones built build ourselves with other living stones into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood 1 Peter 2 1 through 5 therefore laying aside all malice all deceit what it begins with we th- thought, oh, we're going to be clothing ourselves already. No, we first need to lay aside. We need to take off first. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so it's necessary first to build yourself into a spiritual house, and in the spiritual house there needs to be a holy priesthood, kings and priests, and then will we be able to bring spiritual sacrifices those that are religious, they begin with sacrifices first. <clears throat> they start to evangelize. They try, try to uh, put together poems that they can uh, have people hear. The scriptures say you don't need to do any of that. This is, this is not something the Lord will accept. What is necessary? First, I need to, I need to understand that I need to build myself into a house. <clears throat> and so we, we sit in a house right now. This house is a house of God. And 
I see what kind of atmosphere is here and how we treat the word here. I remember that. And now when I take the word of God, when I'm not in this building, I know with what reverence and how this word is read and spoken and treated. And so when I work with the word of God, I know how to treat it because I've heard and seen an example of how I need to work with the word. And I build myself into a spiritual house. And then, of course, the priest comes in and brings spiritual sacrifices. We can conclude that a person who has not built himself into a spiritual house with other precious stones is not able, that is with other saints, is not able to walk with God and furthermore cannot please God. How amazingly Pastor has written this, we can build ourselves into a spiritual house only but only with other precious stones. And so I not only build myself into a spiritual house, but I am a precious stone and you're a precious stone in one construction. And every individual stone is a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. And in every heart, uh, acceptable sacrifices are being brought to Jesus Christ upon the condition if I am a member or a part of a precious stone of multitudes of precious stones of a, of a building of them. Because if I'm not a part of one of the, the building of many precious stones, then I will not be able to be a precious stone and be or be able to build myself into one or bring spiritual sacrifices to God. The Lord sees us individually, but also together here. Pastor notes the importance, the importance of being in the church, but in what church? One that corresponds to the great Jerusalem. Tenth, false strongholds of salvation consist in us thinking that all the written word of God in the Holy Scriptures is rhema, opened and understood for the reasonable abilities of our soul. At the same time, actually, all of the written word in the Holy Scriptures is sealed in the format of Logos, that is, in the format of the thoughts of God, concealed to the carnal man whose mind is not renewed by the spirit of his undedicated or uncommitted mind. The word of God, it is in the format of Logos. Here's the, the format Logos, the, the Bible. The written, the work of pastor is now Rhema. Why? Because Rhema is the word that is not just written. It is the word that is already written by a living person. The Bible is Logos. It is sealed. It is concealed. It is written by people that are not no longer alive. Thousands of years ago, they died. And so when people say, I don't know if there's apostles and prophets today, they say this because they want to interpret the scriptures as they desire. But we need to not confuse uh, this word logos with rhema. rhema. It becomes rhema when the apostle of God is then able to explain it. Revelation 1, 1 through 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the word of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. A person who has the audacity to interpret the thoughts of God with his own mind, independent of the placed by God apostles and prophets, is not able to walk with God and furthermore is not able to please God. And so for this word of God in the format of Logos to become the format of Rhema, the understood, explained word we need to accept God's order. And it says, blessed is the reader, that is, in the singular form, and then those who hear, that is, in the plural form. It 
And so sometimes you'll get these questions uh, in your church. Do you have brothers who read? And when they mean this is that they uh, that they uh, t- teach also. But no, there's one who reads as apostles. We hear and we read, but we together read uh, as in the plural form, but there's one who it reads in the singular form, and there's a difference between the one who reads and then us who read together. A person uh, in the singular form, he's the one who reads his labors. Those who read in the multi- multitude of people who are reading, they read the labors of that person whom the Lord has revealed the truth to. As John, when John had shown him all the revelations, all the things that the Lord had shown John, and everything he wrote down, and he said, what's in your heart, write in the book and sent to the churches. And there are the seven stars that will read your words that you had written. But what is important is you are the reader in the singular form in that case. Therefore, after we erect our Methuselah in the form of the grown by us fruit of righteousness in the place of the destroyed by us false strongholds of salvation and then grow the born to us Methuselah into the virtue of a perfect man who will achieve the fullness of growth of Christ consisted in the symbolic number 300, God intends to change or transform our earthly bodies into the image of heavenly bodies so that like Enoch, he can move us to heaven and allow us to avoid death, expecting all mankind. In this way, giving us the right to the power to clothe ourselves into our heavenly home in the form of our new imperishable body. Therefore, in its entirety, this unique promise is called to be revealed to those who fear God, who made it to the last days or last times by obeying their faith to the faith of God presented in Scripture in the preached word of the apostles and prophets who are called by the Holy Spirit to be the lips of God and carriers of the seed of the word. Relevant to this, we already studied three questions. Pastor had given us four classical questions, and we have studied three of them. Let's remember them shortly. First question, what do we need to do to receive the right and ability to walk with God so that we can please God and receive a living testimony in the form of our imperishable body? And we already looked at this question by studying the event of Jairus. Apostle Arkady writes, the ruler of the Jewish synagogue who symbolically, in the form of the reasonable aspect of our soul, not yet renewed by the spirit of our mind, had justification in the format of the received by him guarantee, consisting in the format of a seed, in the form of his dying twelve-year-old daughter. And to receive the fruit of righteousness from the seed of justification in the form of Methuselah, it was necessary that the seed of justification in the form of his twelve-year-old daughter to die in the death of the Lord Jesus. Due to the death of the seed of justification in the good soil of our heart, in the death of the Lord Jesus, the mind of the ruler of the Jewish synagogue, in the form of the woman who suffered with the illness of bleeding for twelve years, was renewed by the spirit of his mind, which gave him the legitimate ability to present the fruit of righteousness before God, grown by him in the seed of justification, in the form of his resurrected daughter. Jairus needed to experience the death of his twelve-year-old daughter, in order to see the fruit of justification in himself grown by him from the seed of justification, consisting in the resurrection of his twelve-year-old daughter, which is precisely what made him able to build his body from a Jewish synagogue into a temple of the Holy Spirit, or receive the ability to pay the price for the right to walk with God so that he can please God. I've noted for myself in what way we can determine that we have this death, the seed of justification, that we have confirmed our justification. It is determined by our renewed mind. And to determine whether our our justification is confirmed, it is confirmed by the ability of our renewed mind. When this justification died and was received in the form of the fruit of righteousness, when the daughter of Jairus uh, died, the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, at this time, the woman who was bleeding uh, 
was healed, and this woman uh, represents our soul that is, or our mind that is renewed with the spirit of our mind. And so the justification received freely by grace in the form of a seed as a guarantee which can be lost, we have confirmed it. This is determined again by our ability to renew our mind with the spirit of our mind. And so when we have a renewed mind, then this says that I in my heart have confirmed justification. Justification that is not confirmed in my heart can be lost. And how do you determine? Again, my mind will be renewed. Question two, what criteria and characteristics do the scriptures provide for the completeness or fullness of our pure, imperishable, and unsearchable inheritance in Jesus Christ, which is not given to us in the form of a menu in a restaurant where we can choose something and leave something, considering that for every oath promise which is included in our inheritance and the incorruptible and unfading inheritance that is in Jesus Christ, we need to pay a price. Since every promise is given to us exclusively in the format of a seed, which we receive into a conscience that is cleansed from dead works or the soil of our heart, which needs to die in the death of the Lord Jesus, so we can receive the promise as a possession in the form or in the fruit of the kingdom of heaven. In a specific format, we studied the second question in 12 components, identifying our portion or our lot together in the format of our pure and imperishable inheritance. We studied the 12 components which make up our inheritance, and pastor says there are many more of them, but this was sufficient to identify the boundaries within which we can work And so, it's like when a child is trying to learn to draw. And so, it could be a, a bunny, or and there's little dots all over the page, and they tell him, take the, 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 it's the child is told, take a pen or a pencil, and then connect all these dots together to make, a, make it into a, a, a picture. They follow, follow all of the dots, and then it makes out it's made out into a bird or and so we need to connect all the dots and pastor shows us the individually these different dots and so we need to identify <clears throat> pastor the re, who is the reader in the singular form he identifies these dots which we then need to connect and understand And so the Lord places his person who will, who would be able to give us these dots that we can then connect uh, together. And so we had studied together all of these oath promises. And what we need to pay attention to again is that everything that is sown into the good soil of our heart it needs to die so we can receive it as a possession. All of the promises we receive into the good soil of our heart, they die. We receive the seed, the promise that lies at the door of our hope. <clears throat> the Lord doesn't give us the apple. He gives us the seed. And he tells us this is the apple tree. You need to plant it into the ground. And we plant it into the ground and it begins to grow. And you begin to see how beautiful it is what kind of branches it has, what kind of fruit that grows from it. And so it needs to be put into the good soil of our heart. And so if you have the good soil of your heart and you plant all of these promises, they will die and then you will receive them as a fruit of righteousness and will become your possession. Everything that we receive in a seed, in the form of a seed, is still God's possession. But what we receive them in the form of fruit is then our possession. And so any promise, any promise is, needs to become our possession, needs to be grown into fruit. In the third question, we study the price that we need to pay to collaborate our faith with the faith of God so that in this way we can please God. Genesis 5.24, and Enoch walked with God and 
he was not, for God took him. I will remind us of the 12 components, Apostle Arkady writes, identifying the condition or price which identifies the essence of walking before God, although there are many more of them. To walk before or to walk with God means walk in the same light that God walks in, be led by the Holy Spirit, think about what is spiritual, to walk by faith or obey your faith to the faith of God, perform righteousness and sanctify yourself, Clothe yourself into the love of God agape. Take the reproach of those who reproach Christ. Perform the justice of God. Show mercy to the vessels of mercy and call wrath upon the vessels of wickedness. Have a non-greedy character or nature. Forgive your neighbors as Christ has forgiven you. Love righteousness and hate lawlessness. <clears throat> These 12 components which speak about the ability to walk with God. And now let's look at question 4. By what results can we examine ourselves as to whether we are in the faith as to whether we walk with God? Together, I would like to study one very significant component contained in the result, which can be examined by our ability to not be disappointed if our prayer for help is delayed or held up in its path and be prepared for any scenario both in timing as well as method that God has prepared for our good. Here, Apostle Arkady wants to study this unique component to not be disappointed if our prayers are being held up in the way or in their path and be ready or prepared for any scenario both in timing or method of how God wants to do something. The Lord never acts or does things sometimes <clears throat> as we would expect. And our role is not to be disappointed, but to wait patiently. Let's read the place of Scripture, Luke 18, 1 through 8. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? If you paid attention, Brother Kadi writes, all of the individuals contained in this parable, the widow, her adversary wanting her land and the possession of her deceased husband, as well as the unjust judge who avenged her against her adversary, all live in the same or in the one city. And Pastor very beautifully shows how this is all in one person. And in the future we will study this widow. This is a very unique state of our soul the state of the widow who is not married to the old man but has separated with the old man and has received the legal right or ability to marry the new man and the soul was humbled before God because she renewed it and when she renewed it the old man comes and says, everything belonged to me that was here, this house, this car, everything. Your husband died, and by law, all of this is mine. And she needed to go to to find a judge so that he can avenge her. And pastor had shown this judge in the form of our tongue. The unjust judge is our tongue, who in confession needs to avenge this widow and we'll talk about this more in the future and as pastor says before we begin to study the treasure contained in the symbolic parable 
where we see an absence of discouragement, we can determine or judge that we have in ourselves the result by which we can examine ourselves, that we walk with or walk before God. I would like to disengage from the given parable for a moment and look at the nature of one small but significant and noteworthy member of our body upon which our entire body depends and that has the most direct impact to whether we perish or whether we are saved. This is the inflamed with fire nature of our tongue as well as our inflamed with fire born from God heart. We'll talk about the tongue. Pastor explains what the tongue is and its importance, the importance of our tongue and how it, our eternity will, will be impacted or depend upon our tongue. And we will split this into two sermons, and today we'll only talk about or look at what Pastor talks about the tongue, this unjust judge that will need to defend or avenge our widow. And this happens when our, our, humble, our spirit is humbled before God and our soul then becomes a widow. And we will then see the enemy come forth and our unjust judge, our tongue, will need to then avenge her. And so Pastor here talks about the judge who needs to defend the, the widow. And so the scriptures say that all of us, regardless of the fact that we are holy, sin much with our tongue, being responsible for our words. James 3, 2 through 9. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among, uh, so set among other members or our members that if it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it set and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the, of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the sim similitude of God. And so here it's talking about our tongue and about its importance and that it can be bridled, that we can bridle all animals or that we, and we tame all animals, but we can't tame our own tongue. You could put a, a even a lion or a, an elephant or whales, James says, but the small tongue can't be tamed. How important it is to tame and to bridle this tongue. That we, t we control the small rudder and are able then to direct our ship or boat wherever we want it to go. And so when God created Adam, he said, let us create man in our image and likeness and when he created him he said I created man in my likeness in our likeness and unfortunately this was he created him in his image but he did not become in his likeness because all his thoughts were not God's thoughts and he had a spirit soul and body unlike all the rest of the animals <clears throat> but the spirit, soul, and body did not correspond to God's. And so we have the image of God because we have the three, but these three components don't have God's likeness. For them to be in God's likeness, God 
comes into our spirit and bear, bor, bors, bear, bears us again. We're born again. And in our soul, in our mind, or, or in our soul, in our body, uh, we still need to expand salvation upon these two areas. And when we do, then the Lord can say, then this church is in my image and likeness. Mm. And so James speaks of this. According to this place of scripture, we conclude that the one who does not sin with his tongue is the perfect man who is able to discipline his whole body with his tongue. It is referring to a gentle or meek tongue disciplined with the truth concealed within our heart. A tongue that is disciplined with the truth concealed within our heart becomes within our essence a tree of life able to produce fruit 12 times a year and every month and every month of the holy year. Proverbs 15.4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. <clears throat> this happens when we have grown the fruit of righteousness in the good soil of our heart in the form of the born to us Methuselah from the received by a seed of justification a gentle or meek tongue is inflamed by the fire of the Holy Spirit living in a pure and wise heart of the holy person who has gotten to know and has concealed the faith of God within his heart in this way the fire of the Holy Spirit in the wise and good heart of man becomes the fire of the life of his new man from whom the thoughts of a holy person are lit and in turn the fire of our thoughts lit light up or are ignited or they ignite our gentle tongue. Psalm 39, 9 through 5, 9, 39, 3 through 5. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of the days that I may know how frail I am? Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Pay attention to the sequence of this unchanging principle, Brother Akadi writes, which functions within the essence of man, possessing a gentle mouth or a mouth disciplined with the truth that is concealed within his heart. And so we read here about fire, that first the heart needs to be hot or burning within us, this is talking about our spirit, and then in our mind we need to have a fire. This is talking about our soul. And then this fire in the form of confession, he says, I began to uh, speak. And so we see here again that The fire that is the fire of the Holy Spirit in the wise and good heart of man becomes the fire of the life of his new of of his new man or our new man, from whom the thoughts of a holy person are lit, and in turn the fire of our thoughts light up or ignite our gentle tongue. <laughs> Until we grow the fruit of righteousness from the seed of the received by us justification, our tongue will be lit up or inflamed with a fire that is from hell, which is the atmosphere of our old man. And this atmosphere is a fatal energy for our new man. And until we grow the fruit of righteousness from the seed of the received by us justification in the form of the born by the born to us Methuselah, our tongue will be inflamed or lit up by hell fire, which we receive from the gen genetic line from the sinful seed of our fathers in the flesh. Therefore, very important phrase that Brother Akadi writes, depending on the nature of fire that will light up or inflame our tongue is then the same fire that will be our eternal inheritance and atmosphere of our eternal home.
we just read together that our tongue can be inflamed either by hell fire and also can be inflamed by the Holy Spirit. First our heart is inflamed and then in our mind and then in our tongue. But it can also be inflamed by the old man. Depending on the nature of fire that will light up or inflame our tongue, the kind of fire that's inflaming it is then the same fire that will be our eternal inheritance and atmosphere of our eternal home. The fire that's in our mouth is the same fire again that will be in our eternal inheritance and the atmosphere of eternal home. In its nature, God as well as the devil are a devouring fire. The difference, however, in the nat- in the nature of the fire is that in the eternal flame of God, the righteous can live as an, o- an oasis or a cold atmosphere during a summer day. The devil, however, and his servants in the eternal flame of God, which identifies holiness and the glory of God, will be destroyed in their resistance of the truth and will be turned to ash, after which they will never again be able to resist the truth of God. Isaiah 33, 14 through 17. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil, he will dwell on high, his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks, bread will be given to him, his water will be sure, your eyes will see the king in his beauty, they will see the land that is very far off. As you can see, Brother Akadi writes, the glory of God's fire, identifying the burning holiness of God for those who fear God, is called to be an atmosphere of eternal oasis in the form of coolness during a summer day. And for the haters of the established by God order in the Church of Saints, the glory of God's fire, identifying the burning holiness of God, is called to serve as a devouring fire, turning them to ash. Numbers 16, 41 through 49. Let's see when the Lord allowed His fire, His holiness, and glory to show in His fire. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened, when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar. Altar, put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them for wrath has gone out from the Lord the plague has begun then Aaron took took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly and already the plague had begun among the people so he put in the incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living so the plague was stopped and now those who had died and in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the core incident. And so the Lord became angry when he, and he demonstrated his glo- glory and holiness. And his wrath was kindled that stood or that began to rebel against Moses and Aaron. And how can you stop the devouring fire? Moses told Aaron, go quickly, because this fire will not stop with water. And so when you begin to confess the word and your confessions, your fire will meet the Lord's fire, it will stop. And so in this case, we see that you quench God's fire with your own. He's not, here it's not referring to a fire like in, in a campfire. This is when the holiness of the Lord, the holiness of the Lord, this is God's fire, it can be quenched 
with your fire. That's why he said, go, take the censer, and begin to confess before God his glory and his holiness. And when he sees the fire that you will present, you will make atonement. Because when he came out, he began to proclaim, saying, I'm a part of this nation. And when he had seen that Aaron is a part of this nation, and how did he demonstrate this? A priest always walked with a covered head. And so he was testifying, Lord, you're gonna going to destroy yourself here. You will disappear here. And so he, he covered his head. And go, he knew God will not go against himself. He demonstrated that he is representing God's holiness. And when the Lord came and saw this, uh, he knew that he would not destroy himself because he himself will d- be devoured in the, fu- in the fire. Aaron was representing God himself in that moment. And Aaron was testifying before him that this is a part of your inheritance. And we see how it stopped. Therefore, the nature of the all-consuming fire of God's holiness in the camp of Israel protected the representatives of God's order and scourged the violators of this order. And now pay attention to the nature of the devouring fire, identifying the nature of the devil. This fire first devours the devil himself and his angels and turns them to ash of nothingness before all the nations. And in this profane to God fire, they will continually experience eternal shame and eternal suffering. Ezekiel 28, 18, 19 You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It it devours you, and I turned you to ashes. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devours you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the people are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Here it's talking about the fact that the Lord will bring about a fire from their midst and this very fire will devour you. The most terrible is that this profane fire burns today and devours churches of saints who have perverted the truth and they perceive this fire as the fire of the Holy Spirit calling such burning an awakening or enlightenment. The true fire of the Holy Spirit is such a fire of holiness that resists the profane fire, and in its ultimate burning, it devours and consumes all wickedness and resistance to the truth, both in the fallen cherubim and in his angels, as well as people who resist the truth, just as it happened with Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. Isaiah 30, 27-30 Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger, and his burden is heavy, his lips are full of indignation, and his tongue like a devouring fire, his breath is like an overflowing overflowing stream, which reaches up to the neck, to sift the nations with the sieve of futility, and there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people causing them to err. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy festival is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goes with a flute to come into the mountains of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. The Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard and show the descendant of his arm, the scent of his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire with scattering, tempest, and hailstones. The fire of the Holy Spirit, by which our gentle or meek heart is inflamed, and after our pure thoughts are inflamed, which then activates our meek mouth, which will be the throne of God, before whom ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands will minister who are redeemed with the blood of His Son, to whom the throne of judgment will be given, and each one on trial will be given a book of their deeds, by which they will be judged, and 
This honor is for all saints possessing a meek or gentle mouth. Let's read Daniel 7, 9 through 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to, the, to him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. And see what kind of beautiful image. It's saying that it will be necessary to place thrones so that the Ancient of Days can be seated. And so this white throne upon which the Ancient of Days Lord will sit is the ability of a person to be ignited or inflamed by this fire. And so our mouth is his throne. It's not just his throne. It says thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days was seated and the judges were seated as well before him. And before the judges, the books were opened that, that by which they will judge the whole world. And pastor says, think about it, in what way the Lord will allow us to place our throne today. Today, we need to present before the white throne our throne so we not be judged, so that we be judges that will be seated. And for this, it is necessary. Let's read it one more time and let's pay close attention in what way we will place our throne. First, the Lord will have the legitimate right upon earth to place his white throne. And before this white throne, what will be unique will be there will be many other thrones upon which the church of God will be seated. And so how can we place our throne there already where we will be seated, where we can occupy the sp our space? The fire of the Holy Spirit from which our meek heart or gentle mouth is ignited. The throne is not yet there. This is how it begins to be placed. In the beginning, first, our heart needs to be hot in, in us, as it's written, ignited, a gentle heart. And only after our mind, our thoughts will be ignited, our pure thoughts. And what do we have in our arsenal? Our, our gentle heart, our pure thoughts, <clears throat> our pure mind, that will then activate, activate our meek tongue. And our tongue, where fire is ignited, will then be the throne of God. That within our essence uh, will be His throne and will be before Him. We need to prepare ourselves for that moment. And even today, we need to think about what will happen after the 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 time that the after Christ will be here for a thousand years and will reign. Will our throne be there? We need to know that when He will place His throne, the heaven and earth will scatter from the greatness and the holy fire in that moment. But He won't be alone. We we can be there too. And we can be there depending on the fire that's in us so that it be ignited in our pure heart, our, our, our pure thoughts, and our tongue needs to be disciplined with the gentleness of Christ. And so our tongue being disciplined with the gentleness of Christ, then the Lord can say that you are a judge. And in the future, we'll look at this in more detail, looking at the widow who had asked this unjust judge to avenge her, how our tongue then can become a judge who will then avenge, defend our widow. We'll talk about this in the future. Let's thank God for the opportunity to be able to hear and see uh, 
this this word of God. Uh, this was a sermon from July 2nd, 2023. Of course, Pastor there talks uh, about, uh, he expands on these things a little bit more. Um, uh, if you want to watch the, the video from that time, let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the great privilege to be upon the place where you have placed a remembrance of your name. This is the place where we can worship before you. This is the place where you desire to reveal your revelations, the place where you want to teach us, the place where you defend us and lift us up to your level. We thank you, Lord, for the inheritance that we have in you, that you are a part of our inheritance. Your word and the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is our inheritance. Thank you, Lord, that we have received this inheritance with those who fear you. We received this inheritance with Jacob and Israel. And we thank you that in this inheritance, we also have all of our essence, our spirit, our soul, and our body is a part of your inheritance. You have promised that you will keep without blemish our spirit, our soul, and our body at the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we confirm your power of resurrection for our bodies, and we thank you for the power of resurrection upon the place where death still demonstrates itself in Jesus Christ we thank you for a complete victory that death is devoured by victory the victory of Jesus Christ we thank you Lord that today you have allowed us to be taught how to walk before your holy face we have accepted this truth we keep it in our heart and today we thank you that for what is in our heart we have made the decision to walk before your holy face so that we can please you. And for this, we make the decision to walk in the light in which you walk. We've made the decision to be led by the Holy Spirit, to have spiritual thoughts, to forgive those who offend us, forgive our neighbors, vessels of mercy, and pour out your wrath upon the vessels of wrath. We thank you, Lord, that we do this not from the position of our feelings and emotions, We do this from the position of knowledge, from the position of a renewed mind. We thank you, Lord, that you give us the ability to judge upon this holy place and perform judgment. You call us your own because you allow us, by the truth that we've received and the Holy Spirit that has revealed to us the meaning of this truth, to destroy within our personal life all the false strongholds of salvation so that you can receive the legitimate right upon the place where death is still present to reign in the stronghold of life and resurrection. And so, Lord, we make the decision today to be free of all of the strongholds of the false strongholds of salvation. Thank you for the strongholds we receive in the in the form of uh, seeds so we can grow it into righteousness. We thank you, Lord, for the ability to forgive vessels of mercy, those saints that have your likeness, our neighbors. We thank you, Lord. We make the decision because if we don't forgive their, the sins of others, you will not forgive the, our own sins. We thank you, Lord, that you want to see our bodies a temple of the Holy Spirit, but for it to become a temple of the Holy Spirit, you want our soul to worship before you and to acknowledge you in the form of your messengers, to bow before your feet and embrace your feet, those people whom you have sent to speak what is good to us. We thank you, Lord, for your feet, for your messengers 
whom you, whom we embrace and whom we thank you for. We thank you, Lord, for the word that you have passed on to us by the person who is your feet, who has given us these wonderful revelations. And Lord, we have received the word that he has passed on to us so that we can build ourselves into a house of God, into a temple of the Holy Spirit, build ourselves into a holy priesthood so that we can bring spiritual sacrifices to Jesus Christ or in the name of Jesus Christ. We, th- we thank you that we can worship in spirit and in truth and that it can happen only upon the place where you have put a remembrance of your name. And when we pray in boldness, believing in the fact that you hear us and you hear us when we ask according to your will and we received your will, we have heard your will and we confess your will today with our mouth. We thank you, Lord, that you live within us because we made the decision to die through the law to the law so we can live for you and that it is no longer us who live, but you who live in us. We thank you, Lord, that you live in the temple of our body in the form of your word and that we have magnified your word in the temple of our body as you have magnified within our service, in our church. And we thank you, Lord, that every one of us is a precious stone and we as precious stones are being built. We build ourselves into a great temple and this great spiritual house. We thank you, Lord, that every one of us is a part of your great project where you will live and every one of us is a house of God. We thank you, Lord, for this great revelation. You have allowed us to live under grace because we made the decision that your grace reign in us through righteousness. And for this, we receive justification According to your will, we received it in the format of a seed. We received the work of redemption, the redemption of Jesus Christ. And our deeds go behind us, but your deeds and the deeds of your son, Jesus Christ, they go ahead of us. And when we stand before you, we laid our crowns down before you and we thank you for what you have done for us and who you are for us, that you have delivered us, you redeemed us from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and have made us kings and priests, and we will reign, we will rule on this earth with you. We thank you, Lord, that you don't just call us kings, but also judges, but for us to be judges, you first want to place your law, your godly fire, into our gentle, humble heart, so that from our heart, our soul can be ignited, our mind, so we can renew our mind with the spirit of our mind, and so that the fire of God that is within our spirit and our heart can also burn within our thoughts. So then after, the fire of the Holy Spirit can then come upon our meek and gentle tongue, and we confess the faith of our heart. And when you will see your fire, the fire of God, not a profane fire, but your fire, in the confessions of our mouth, then you will allow us to place our throne together with your throne and you will judge your church together with your church. This world, you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel with your saints whom you have made your judges. And for this, we want today that our tongue be ignited by the Holy Spirit, that it not be ignited by hellfire, because that fire that our tongue is ignited with today is the same fire that will be our eternity. We thank you, Lord, for eternity and for eternal life, that your fire of holiness will be for us the coolness of, of day where we will communicate with you because you gave us the ability to live amongst a burning fire, a consuming fire. We thank you, Lord, for this place. We thank you, Lord, for that person that has passed on these precious truths to us. We pray, Lord, that 
this man be completely restored before you so that he can continue to pass on those treasures that are already the possession of his heart. May they become the possession of his mouth so that they become the possession of our heart and our mouth. We thank you, Lord, for your great mercy, a great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Allow me to make a small announcement. We have amongst us Andrew and Ivan. I would ask you to please come out here. These brothers of ours have moved here permanently. They came from South Carolina. They are living in America for one year. They are a part of our church. They were in Ukraine. And from Ukraine, they came to South Carolina. And they have now traveled here to Oregon permanently to live here. And so, Andrew and Ivan, so that we not be confused. And so, I, you are Ivan. This is Andrew and this is Ivan. And so, our saints, again, have, have moved here uh, permanently. Uh, if you can please welcome them and assist them. These are young men, and if you can please become familiar with them, they will need some help with maybe finding a job, uh, a, a, a permanent place of living. Uh, so they become familiar with Oregon in general. They are not familiar with the state. Uh, they are a year in America. Their parents were here, uh, but they returned. They went back to South Carolina, and they uh, will also be moving here at some point, but they began with allowing their sons to move here first. And so if you could please welcome them, invite them, become familiar with them uh, so that they can uh, can stabilize. And so let us finish uh, with our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen <laughs> 